Okay, yes, um, let's, let's talk about going backwards, as Susan says, to, to sort of thinking back to where it all comes from. Uh, and firstly, let me take one of Susan's statements, uh, that there is enough. There is a lot more than enough. Uh, that thing produces about 10,000 times as much energy as we actually need. And I would assert that it's, again, to take something from the Alcoholic Liquor Advisory Council, uh, it's not the using energy, it's the way we're using energy that matters. Um, anyhow, this, this satisfies all our needs. Uh, those who want nuclear power, there it is, fusion power. Those who want hydrogen energy, there it is, the sun runs on hydrogen. Those who want carbon sequestration, there it is, when it's burned out in 500 million years, no, 5 billion years, uh, it reverts to a white dwarf, which is mostly carbon, and it's mostly sequestrated. How do we use it? Uh, let's look at one aspect of using the sun, and that's for solar water heating. Uh, typical household, about 35 to 40% of their energy is used for water heating. That's about 10% of all electricity in New Zealand, and about 3% of all energy. The way you collect it is in the past, and let me say what I'm going to do now is look at where we've been, where we're at, where we're going. Um, the old tube on sheet collector consists of a flat plate of conducting metal attached to, attached to risers, attached to headers. And the collector is usually made of copper uh, because of its high conductivity. It's then enclosed in a box with a glass cover on the top and insulation behind. So you've got glass cover, air gap, collector, insulation. The performance can be analysed by engineering techniques and produces a performance equation that looks like that and if you put it on a graph it looks like that. So the best you can do up here is about 70 odd percent and the worst you can do with a typical flat plate matte black collector is uh, a temperature of about 100 degrees above ambient, by which time all your heat losses take over and you get nothing into the water. Most domestic hot water is collected in the region to the left of the blue vertical line. These things are connected to your hot water cylinder, uh, and I might add that this, this is a, a generality of um, renewable resources is that they are highly variable and therefore an essential element in the use of all renewables is some form of storage. In the case of solar water heating, it's your hot water cylinder. Um, typically you can either, let's take the right hand diagram, collect by thermosiphoning in which the tank has to be above the collector or you can have a pump circulated system in which the collector can, can be above the tank and you have to have a control system which uh, um, turns the pump on and off uh, as and when uh, it's needed. Uh, in the company I've been associated, the controller has always been called Marvin after Hitchhiker's Guide because it has a brain big enough to run a solar system and all it does is turn a pump on and off. <laughs> uh, these systems uh, characteristically look like that. The, the one on the left is, is a, uh, a pump circulated system with the tank inside the house. The one on the right is a thermosiphon system in which the tank has to be above the collector and is often on the outside. Um, my involvement uh, with, with solar water heating came uh, when I got looking at, at flat plate collectors and decided that copper was getting more and more expensive and that one needed to do something about making a collector that was as good as a copper one but didn't use much copper. And I settled on a process called a heat pipe which, which provides a very high thermal conductivity. And heat pipes have been known for about 150 years. Uh, basically they consist of a tube 
with a little bit of liquid in it and no air. So if you heat the bottom, the liquid evaporates, goes to the top, condenses, dribbles back and recirculates. And that has a thermal conductivity about a thousand times that of copper. So at high thermal conductivity, not highly dependent on the materials you make, and it's a diode, it conducts in only one direction. We set about trying to make a flat plate version of that to replace the copper sheet, and we succeeded with an envelope uh, which has a heat exchanger just on the top edge so that heat is always conducted upwards. As I said, it's a diode type device, and we managed to make a flat plate collector, the key to which was making a heat pipe that always operated just below atmospheric pressure. And could be made out of steel because the conductivity is due to the mechanism. There's the, the thing we fi finally finished up with. Um, and as I said, the diode characteristic means that among other things in, in solar water heating, you have a problem because you're taking water out onto your roof and uh, it can freeze and God, did us a dirty trick when he made water because it expands when it freezes and it'll burst your pipes. So you have to avoid that and it's usually done by recirculating some water in the panel and in the case of a um, heat pipe device you only have to heat the bit that's got water in it and it doesn't matter if the rest freezes. Right, what's happening next is uh, the introduction of other types of collector. The evacuated tube also, some of them use heat pipes and uh, it can collect uh, a little more effectively than uh, um, a, a black collector. It has about the same um, maximum performance but it uh, stagnates at higher temperatures and can therefore work at weaker sunshine and, uh, and lower ambient temperatures. Uh, this means that you can use a slightly smaller area of evacuated tubes than you would a flat plate collector. It also means that it goes on heating if you don't take the water away. So this is a plot of the temperature rise in a tank, a modelled tank, uh, with no takeoff. So the water rises on the first day to 70, on the second day to 90, on the third day to 100, and that's flat, a matte, matte black. Uh, flat plate collector. If you go to evacuated tubes on the first day, the same area of collector basically, a little less, goes to 70, second day 102, third day 120, and so it goes on up. So introducing uh, a device like that is good in places where the sunshine is weak and the ambient temperatures are poor, uh, but it's not so good if you've got reasonable sunshine. And for New Zealand and Australia, I think the evacuated tube uh, offers minor advantages in area and a major problem in overheating. Um, so where to next? Uh, the next development in water heating is in heat pumps, and I haven't got much in the way of pictures for heat pumps. Um, well, no, let, let me first show you the, the versatility of uh, solar water heaters. You can use them in all sorts of configurations. Um, the next developments will be in heat pumps, which are coming now. The heat pump is uh, pretty much the same total savings in electricity as a solar water heater, but with somewhat different characteristics. Uh, if you haven't got a good site for a solar water heater, then a heat pump is a good option. And I think we'll see more heat pumps coming into use over the next few years. And finally, although, uh, again, Susan might not like it, uh, the, I, I, I think we can see a future for PV uh, in domestic use. Uh, since I've been interested in this over the last 20 years, the um, holy grail of photovoltaics is the one US dollar a watt PV panel. Uh, for the last 20 odd years, it's been about three years away. Uh, it arrived last year. The, these are panels installed in Germany. Uh, they are cadmium telluride, they're not silica panel, silicon panels. Um, 
and they came out of the factory at 98 US cents a watt, finished installed uh, system came out to about uh, four <coughs> New Zealand dollars a watt, two euro a watt installed and connected to the grid. So when we get um, um, net metering so that the excess electricity you will produce from your solar panels in the summer can be stored in Lake Pukaki uh, and recovered in the winter, thank you, uh, then we will start to see PVs coming into, into use. Okay, thank you. <laughs>